Come on. Wow. How we doing, church? Said, how we doing, church? <laughs> Come on. Let's give, give God praise right now. Come on. Come on. Praise worthy of a king. Keep it going. Come on. For the king. For our soon and coming king. Praise the name of Jesus. Welcome into the room. I'm going to hand things off to our campus pastor and team in Yakaya. They can just take control of their service there now. Um, I wanted to start off with a question this morning, and that is, what is it going to cost? Because isn't that where every invitation and every relationship ends up at some point? What's it going to cost? We're in this series that we have titled Follow, uh, a journey of discipleship, because that's really what it is. It's a journey. And I just thank everyone that's been involved this morning in the back, in the front, uh, Tina, Cameron, um, Mark, team. Um, if you ever wondered how all this works, just look around a little bit. And if you've ever wondered how you could get involved and be a part of that plan, all you got to do is talk to any of the people that you've seen up here on stage or in the back of the room. We'd love to have you jump in. But man, I just have been receiving so many emails and a lot of text messages, phone calls on this series, the content in these messages, because I think it has, has reached some of you. Tina said, I didn't really think about this until Tina mentioned February being the, the month of love or the love month that, that really this series about discipleship has come down just to that. To love. This is where God is leading us. This is what God is teaching us. This is the process of discipleship that we learn to love like Jesus loves. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So have you found some application for your life around this? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I think we actually, I had a call from somebody that got a job this week. I think it may have been that she got dressed for work and stood at the front door and opened to the book of job and began to read there. I told you if somebody tried it, it would work, right? And now I told you about this phone call I got. Now you're going to try it and it's going to work for more people. That's not what Christianity is at all. All right, we covered that last week. If you missed last week or any of the weeks that got us here on this journey, you can always go back and re-watch those or watch those for the first time on our website, newsongonline.church. Those messages will be there until Jesus returns. That's just how the internet works. So we hope if you missed anything, you'll go back and get caught up. But what we've been talking about just really quickly for review this week, we've been looking at the fact that everyone is invited. Everyone is invited. And we have said these, the things that we often think disqualify ourselves like sin or even um, unbelief or doubt. Those aren't things that disqualify us at all. In fact, those are prerequisites. Everyone that received an invitation from Jesus had this issue. In fact, one of his closest followers, one of his guys, actually had a nickname, Doubter, all right? Doubting, like it was in his name, right? Okay, so if it's in his name, we realize that these are not things that disqualify us, but actually are prerequisites. And then last week, we got to the point where we were asking ourselves, well, if we're going to follow Jesus, because here's the premise, like we, we started out this year saying like we're ready to go. We feel ready to move. We feel called in some way, called forward, all right? We need to be led. And we looked at the scriptures and see there that God is ready to lead us, that he is a God that leads, a shepherd that leads. He's a good shepherd. And so if he's going to lead, our natural response should be to follow. And so that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at what it means to follow. And if we're going to follow, we'd like to know what the end game is. Like, what's the payoff? Like, what's the reward? And we looked at that last week, that Jesus, as he leads us, where does he lead us? And if you missed it again, go back and see that and listen to that. And today we're going to take one step further on this journey, and we're going to look at 
the fine print. The fine print. Like in every contract, think about it, in every contract, there is like a, a big offer. Like there's the, there's the promise, right? But then somewhere in that contract, there is the fine print. And we've talked about really throughout this series that there are a lot of advantages to following Jesus. It's a lot of advantages, which is sort of in the background what this series has, has been about, what it's uncovered. But as many of you have discovered, and everyone ultimately discovers, there's a price to pay for following Jesus. Okay? At some point, it's going to cost you something. And it's in that moment that we realize, or we come to understand, it's in that moment that we discover, am I really a follower? Or am I just a consumer? So that's the question that we've asked, and that's the question we're going to continue to ask simply, am I following? Okay, so today I want to take us through a passage of Scripture, all right, um, where in Mark 8, if you brought your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 8. We're going to be back in the Gospels this morning, looking at Mark chapter 8. We'll put it on the screen. You can follow along there. That's what most people do. Or if you brought your Bible, go ahead and get it out. But here in Mark chapter 8, Jesus realizes that in this group of people, uh, this crowds of people that have been following him, um, he realizes that, that some of them have just sort of been along for the ride. They're just consumers and not necessarily followers. And he does a super important teaching. And it opens the door for some big life Questions that, that I just want us to wrestle with a little bit this morning. Does that sound good? As we look at the, the fine print and see that following Jesus, um, again, that in following Jesus, there are huge benefits. Like, I mean, you, you will be a better husband. You will be a better wife. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better um, friend. You'll be a better person. You're going to be more honest. You're going to be um, more generous. You're going to be quicker to forgive and and apologize. You're going to to serve more. There are endless benefits to following Jesus. Jesus even said, if you obey what I teach, it will be like your house, like your life is built on the rock, on a a firm foundation. And and if you don't obey and you don't follow, then it will be like your house is built on the rock. On the sand, and, and we should know here in the North Bay what that looks like. All the rain that we've had, right? There's things that stand and things that don't stand. Things with a firm foundation, they stand. Things that don't, things that have a foundation of sand, they don't. We've all seen that, maybe just these last few weeks. But there are great benefits in following Jesus. But at some point, hear me, there's a price to pay. In Mark 8, if you have that there, you can follow along. Um, Jesus kind of explains this to his first century followers. Some of those first followers right there, in that moment, he explains to them, teaches them what that looks like. So, Mark chapter 8. Ready? Ready? All right, here we go. Okay, I'll read. Here we go. Starting in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his disciples, his followers, went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, familiar conversation if you grew up in church like me, Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Who do people say that I am? So Jesus knew there was this kind of buzz about him. Um, this, be careful with this question. This is not just a question you want to ask anybody anytime, like over lunch. What are people saying about me? <laughs> you may not want to know, right? Um, or or they, they may not be saying anything, all right? So here's Jesus. He kind of understands there's this buzz around him, um, around the things that are surrounding him. So he says to his apostles, his closest followers, he says, um, hey, what are people saying about me? Go on. They replied, some say John the Baptist, all right? So John the Baptist had recently been beheaded, and so they thought that maybe this was John the Baptist come back to life in the form of Jesus. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. 
Jesus kind of makes a transition right here and says, okay, enough about what everybody else is saying, enough about what the others are saying. How about you? Who do you say I am? Verse 29, who do you say I am? And Peter immediately raises his hand. He's like, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. I know, I know, I know. You are the Messiah. Now, Messiah is a Jewish term. The Greek term is Christ. Some of you thought Christ was Jesus' last name. Not so, all right? Aren't you glad you came to church? All right, okay, so Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. In the Hebrew, Messiah means the anointed one, anointed one. The ancient Jewish people, they were waiting for God to send his, this anointed one, this chosen one, this final one, the final king. And Peter speaks up and says, I know who you are. You're the one we're waiting for. And Jesus responded in this way, and we kind of think, what right here? But we're going to move on. He, he warned them not to tell anyone about it. He said, shh, 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 not, not yet. It's not time yet. It's not time for everyone to know. So once he identified himself to his closest followers, he begins to tell them, hey, there is a price to pay for following me. Listen to what he says. We'll pick it up in verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that would be him, Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke plainly about this. And Peter, Peter, Peter who had just recognized him as the anointed one, as, as the Messiah, Son of the living God, Peter, it says Peter took him aside, Peter took Jesus, picture this, and began to rebuke him. Yeah, that's what I thought this week when I read it, yeah. Um, Jesus is telling his closest followers, picture this, here's what's going to happen. Things are going to get tough. I, he was speaking to them that day, I wonder, could he be speaking to us today? Things are going to get tough. You're following me now. I hope you continue to follow me. And Peter's like, wait, 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 wait. Pause. Time out, Jesus. And he pulls Jesus out of the crowd and he says, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, Jesus. Listen, don't go all dark and negative on us. <laughs> um, like things are really good. I mean, people are following. Look over there. Look at the crowd. There's a crowd. And um, there's a crowd actually everywhere we go. You're famous. I'm kind of famous. It's pretty. John, he's not as famous as me, but, you know, he's kind of famous, right? Things are going well. What is this? What is this? You're going you're gonna to get arrested um, and killed? You're not. <laughs> You're the Messiah, right? You're the anointed one, right? You can't be killed. Like, seriously, come on. Remember when we were out in the boat and the storm came and everything? It was, we all thought we were going to die, and, and you said, you know, settle down. Wind, settle down. And, and even the weather obeys you, right? So, so no more negative. No more, um, let's, just, let's just go back over there. And let's talk about miracles or something like that. Yeah. Um, let's do that. The people like that. Or let's talk about something positive, but no more of this death and dying stuff, okay? But we continue, verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, uh-oh, he rebuked Peter. Listen to this. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He did what Peter did. <laughs> Jesus rebuked Peter. Now, check this out. Listen, this is why the, um, the rebuke, I believe, was such so harsh of Peter. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, this is a big verse, and it finds itself right to the middle of our follow series. And um, it's, it's a big verse for most of us, if not all of us. 
You simply don't have God's concerns in mind. You have human concerns. You have your concerns. So let me explain what's going on here. He, he, really, Jesus calls Peter out. And he says, Peter, let's just be honest. Don't, there's no sense in trying to hide it. You've enjoyed following me. It's, it's been great, hasn't it? It's been great following me. I mean, you're Peter the fisherman, right? Our people know you. They know your name. It's good to follow me. But Peter, you're acting like a consumer and not like a follower. A consumer is in this for what they can get out of it. I, I want you to be my follower, which means when you and I, when, when I go somewhere that is displeasurable, when I lead you somewhere that might cost you something, I want to know that you're with me. And the reason I'm rebuking you so harshly, Peter, is because you have exposed something. You're concerned about what's going to happen to you because of what might happen to me. You're not concerned about me. You're concerned about you and what might happen to you because of what might happen to me. Then Jesus uses this as he did so well. He uses this as a teaching moment. And not just for the, the apostles, not just for his closest followers, but for everyone in the crowd. And I would say we join that crowd today. As Jesus teaches us, as he reveals the fine print of what it means to follow Jesus. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then he called the crowd. Okay, this is, this is the teaching moment. Remember, we talked about this last week. There's, there's the crowd. There's his disciples, and then there's all the other people that are following him from town to town, the people from that town. He called the crowd along with his disciples, and he begins to teach. He says, you guys join us. Come on, we're going to have a little conversation here. I'm going to teach something. Um, everyone have a seat. Apostles, you come down here in the front row. You really need to listen. Peter, front and center, I have a special seat for you. You need this, okay? Listen, and then, then he reveals what it's going to mean from this point forward to those that are listening, to you listening today, what it's going to mean, what it's going to require to follow him. And this is a very important lesson. It's very important, I believe, what God wants to speak to us about today. What Jesus says to them is absolutely literal because it is about to literally happen to him, okay? This is the season that we're in. Now, here's the great news for you and me. No matter how closely we follow Jesus, you and I will not be, probably not be, crucified. Now, you and I may have some difficult decisions to make, but nothing like what these guys were about to have to face. So listen, verse 34, Jesus says, Then he called the crowd to him, there it is, along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple, which means follower, must deny themselves and take up their what? Take up their cross. And this scared them to death. Take up your cross and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my follower, don't miss this, who, who, not just simply a Jesus consumer, like I like to follow Jesus because it's cool, because it gets me in places I can't usually get in. I like to obey Jesus because I'm a better person. Life is just better. That's good. There are big benefits to following Jesus. But he says, if you really want to be my follower, there will be moments where you are going to have to deny yourself. Okay? By the way, this is not some big, scary, mysterious, theological thing. You do this all the time. You, you do this, you've done this at the table where somebody comes by and says, would you like to order dessert? And you say, no, <laughs> I'm on a diet. Uh, no, I'm not eating sugar. I'm not eating sweets right now. You deny yourself. When you deny yourself, you're simply saying no to self. I don't 
know really how good this group that Jesus was talking to this particular day was at denying themselves. We are horrible at it. Okay? And I think I know who to blame, but that's not important this morning. <clears throat> but generationally, it's been passed down to, to us. And we seem to get better and better at it, or worse and worse, yeah. at denying ourselves. So, denying ourselves is simply saying no. Here's something I want, but it's not what's best for me. I say no to me. Jesus says there's going to be a time. There's coming a time. There are going to be moments. There's going to be forks in the road. There's going to be intersections. There's going to be points of tension where what I want for you is different than what you want for you. And you're going to have to decide, are you a follower or are you a consumer? And if you decide to be a follower, you are going to have to deny yourself. You are going to have to say no to you in order to say yes to me. Then Jesus, he looks at the crowd. He says, I don't want you to miss where this is going. That's why I'm sharing this with you this morning. I don't want you to miss where this is going. Jesus says, I don't want to pull any punches. I'm not holding anything back. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to be surprised. If you follow me from this point forward, I need you to understand some things. I need you to understand first that you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. Now, I don't know what the first thing is that jumps into your mind when you think about a cross, but um, I think we often think about jewelry, maybe a cross. I saw some beautiful crosses some of you are wearing on jewelry this morning, all right? Um, maybe you've seen a cross, maybe you've seen a crucifixion in a movie, you know, and it was, it was maybe gory, but there was like really nice music playing in the background. Um, like if it got too much, you could like mute it, and it wasn't so bad. But you've never seen it. We've never smelled it. I mean, I could give you some really graphic de depictions of, uh, and descriptions of what might happen, uh, what happens to the body when it's crucified. But uh, some of you would have to get up and leave the room. But those listening that day, the people in this crowd, they had seen it. And they had smelt it. And they had walked by it. Because Rome was really good at, at leaving crosses up in common areas where as people went by, they would see it. And, and the Roman government would use that as, as a way to um, terrify people into submission. Okay? So they, they knew, they, they were getting a very clear picture. It was a, crucifixion was a horrible way to die. And Jesus says, you need to understand, if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you something. Now, you can imagine that they, they are scared, right? Because this picture is in their mind. So um, some of the people in the crowd had to be like, you know, I think this is where I say bye. I, I think this is where, you know, this has been great and all. You know, I really enjoyed the miracle thing, um, all that, and watching you heal people. And uh, I remember the day you fed everybody. That was really cool. Uh, and I even heard about you getting like, out of the boat and walking on the water. I've been telling everybody that story. Like, that's just, I've really enjoyed this. Um, it's been awesome. But now you're telling us it's going to cost us something. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. I'm not sure that following you is, is going to be worth it from now on. And Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knows your heart. Jesus knows my heart. He, and he knows it scares them. I mean, uh, that's why uh, so many have left the church. Today, Maybe you. Maybe you're back for the first time in a long time. Maybe it's why you for too long have had one foot in and one foot out. Because it just costs too much to really follow Jesus. I and mean, it's not that you don't believe. You believe. You just, you just don't want to say no to you. I understand that. I do. And Jesus understood that. And so he's looking at the crowd, a crowd that's just like us. I don't know, you know, it just, it seems like it's going to be, he didn't, he should have told us this up front when he invited us 
He said, hey, follow me. You know, seems like he waited a little long to, to get to the fine print. But Jesus says, now before you, before you leave, uh, before you freak out, let, let me just put the invitation to follow in a, in a broader context for you. Jesus is so brilliant. We see that here. I mean, as I read these kind of things, I just think, this is, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, if you did, you would take credit for it, all right, instead of give somebody else credit for it. Um, and so this is so rich and so deep. Listen to what Jesus said to the crowd that is suddenly worried about, is it worth it? Is it, is it really worth it to really follow Jesus? Look at what he says, verse 35, we pick it up. Whoever wants to save their life, ooh, that's me, right? Is that you? Like, whoever wants to save their life, okay, I'm in. Would you like to save your life? Yes, all right, yes, I do. Yes, you do too. Um, that's why you exercise. That's why you eat the way that you eat, right? That's why you wear your seatbelt, okay? Um, we want to save our life. Everybody in the crowd that, day, crowd that day is like, yes, okay, yes. Jesus is a brilliant communicator. We see this on full display right here. So he says, says something to everyone. The audience is going to go, start nodding their head like you all did. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah, we're in. Okay, yeah, common ground. Whoever wants to save their lives will lose it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, no matter how well we eat, no matter how much we exercise, no matter what environments I avoid, no matter how many bad habits I break, no matter how hard I work to save my life, one day I'm going to lose it. Okay, death is undefeated. Okay? One day I'm going to lose it. Okay, we're with you, Jesus. Jesus continues. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me. So, so whoever loses their life, well, that's everybody. Everybody's going to lose their life, right? Right? Yeah. At some point, we're all going to lose our life. But whoever chooses to follow, and in the process of following me, Jesus says, in the, follow of, in the process of following Jesus loses their life, they're going to lose their life, the life that they're going to lose anyway, but they're going to uh, they're, they lose something of value that they're going to die and, and leave anyway, loses a relationship that's going to end anyway, um, loses anything that we would say, this is my life, this is what life is all about. Jesus says anyone who loses what they would consider life because they choose to follow me for the sake of the gospel will save it. What? <laughs> You're saying, What? He says, yeah, I know, I'm scaring you, but I just need you to know the end game. I need you to, to understand the finish line, that the life that you're trying to save, you're going to lose. But listen, if you follow me and lose your life, or, or whatever life is to you, if you follow me and lose something that you consider valuable, if you lose it because you've decided to follow me, I'm giving you an opportunity to lose it with purpose. Wow. Wow. And he's not even done. He's not even really started. Listen to this. He asked them a really important question. He says in verse 36, What good is it if someone, for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Forfeit means to pay or give up or trade in or lose. He says, let's just let's play an imaginary game for a minute. It's getting kind of tense. Let's just imagine everything. I mean, let's imagine you have everything. Uh, imagine that it all belongs to you. Whatever all is to you, you have it. Jesus says, what good is it if you gain everything and at the end of the life that you're going to lose anyway, the life that you're going to trade, he said, what if at the end of that life that you can't hold on to, you have forfeited, you've given up, you've traded your soul? What if at the end of all of this, what if at the end of this, the most awesome life you've realized by living this incredible life that you've forfeited eternity? You've forfeited your soul. And you may say, what does that even mean? What, what does it even mean to forfeit your soul? Well, he doesn't tell us, but I'm thinking it's not a good thing to forfeit your soul. Maybe he just means like you're gone. 
Maybe it means you're tormented. or Maybe it means hell. I don't know. He doesn't tell us. But he says, if you are hanging on to this life, if, that if you hang on too tightly, you can actually, for it may cause you to forfeit your soul. How would you respond to that? And as they're thinking about it, here in our crowd, they're thinking about it. He continues because he's brilliant, and Jesus just moves on in his teaching. And he says, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And actually for us in the future, a better translation would be what would, or what would anyone give in exchange for their soul? He said, let's turn around and let's think about it a different way. Let's say you're at the end of this awesome life, and you've got everything, everything you've ever wanted. You've amassed it all, and all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, I'm about to go to eternity where I have forfeited my soul. And Jesus says, in that moment, and this is such a great question, in that moment, would you, what would you trade to get your soul back? We would trade everything, right? Anything. We would trade it all. Like there would be no negotiation. The question I would ask back, probably you would ask too, is what do I have to give back? What, what is it, what do, what do I have to do not to forfeit my soul? And in that moment, Jesus answered both questions. What good is it if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Nothing. It's no good. And what would you give in exchange for your soul? Everything. Anything. To which Jesus says, now, look what you've discovered about yourself. (laughs) Those who were afraid to follow me, those who were afraid of what you're going to have to give up, those afraid of, of having to say no to yourself, here's what you discover. You discovered that your soul is of greater worth, of greater value than anything else and that is a powerful life-changing life-defining discovery and Jesus was said because he's not done here's what he says verse 38 look at it if any of you talking to the to people right there that group right there in front of him if anyone I just wonder if God has anything to say to us today if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation I talk to some church people, and they act like this has been the first adulterous and sinful generation that we've ever known. Here's Jesus talking about the time, his time, as an adulterous and sinful generation. In other words, when somebody says, in that time, in your moment, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? Oh, no, 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 not me, not me. I was just walking by. I just, I'm not really a follower. I was just here for the miracles, right? All right? I just wanted to see if anything might happen. I just, I'm not, you know, just, it's, if any of you, if any of you who claim to be my follower, when it gets, when it gets tough, when you have to deny yourself, if all of a sudden you are ashamed to be associated with me, The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with all the holy angels. I feel like we had a little taste of that this morning. But soon and very soon, Jesus is returning. What is that? What what is the moral of this story? It's a good one. For us, for today, it's this. It's salvation is free. Salvation is free. It costs us nothing. That you can become a follower of Jesus. Maybe for you, you can return to Jesus today by placing your faith in Jesus. And that costs you nothing. Because at the cross, at the cross, at the cross, Jesus paid the price for your salvation. That's good news, everybody. Salvation, becoming a Christian, becoming a follower, becoming a member of the household of God, the family of God, through Christ is absolutely free. 
You don't do anything to earn it. But following Jesus in your lifestyle, following Jesus in this life will eventually cost you something. At some point in the journey, everybody, there's going to be a conflict of interest. And you're going to have to make a decision. And in that moment, you will know that this is the moment that we were talking about today. And you're just going to know that in this moment, in that moment where following Jesus is going to cost you something. And not only that, but it's going to feel a little bit like a death. But you know what else it's going to be? For you and for me, it's going to be a defining moment. A defining moment for you because if you decide to say no to you and yes to Jesus, you'll discover something that you can't discover any other way. You'll discover in that life-defining moment, you'll discover I'm not just a consumer. I'm a follower. Will you bow your heads with me? Salvation is free. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It won't cost you anything. Jesus paid for all of that. But following Jesus Christ will eventually cost you something. Sound like too much? Remember that refusing to follow Jesus, I think, will cost you a lot more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these ancient texts. We thank you for preserving them, the stories, the accounts of your life, your words, for us to listen to and learn from today. We thank you for your word, the word of truth, truth when it seems like there is no truth. We have the truth, and by the truth, we are born again. We are free. And if you've not been born again, if you've not put your trust in Jesus, if you've not received that free gift of salvation, oh, friend, I invite you today, right where you sit, to just say yes to Jesus' invitation, to just say yes to God's love through Jesus. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray for you. If you want to receive the love of God today, in Jesus, just slip your hand up so I can count you in this prayer. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe you have put your trust in Jesus, but you just know as a follower, it's been a whole lot about you. And, and, and making it about you, you know, while some of that is, can feel pretty good, you, you know you've wandered away and wandered maybe well from the path that God has for you. If that's you and you're here today, I just want to count you in this closing prayer. Would you just slip up your hand, not so much that I can see it, but so that God can see it, that you would say in faith today, I want to take a step back to the path. I want to take a step back to relationship and fellowship with God. If that's you, just slip your hand up so I can count you in the prayer. Yeah, sure, good. Hands, thank you. God, thank you. Just pray this right now, would you, just as we do every week. Holy Spirit, what is it that I need to take from this message this morning? What is it that I need to take with me from this morning? What is it that you're teaching me? What is it that you're saying to me about my life and about my walk? Because today, I am declaring that I I'm a follower of Jesus, and I want to follow you. I will need your help, Holy Spirit, but I want to follow you to the best of my ability for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.